Okay, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the second day of, um, of SIM 2021. Um, it's the exact same bill as yesterday. Uh, with, no, it's not the same bill as yesterday because today actually we have the keynote speaker uh, ready to go for the first, for the keynote presentation. So uh, that's different. Uh, and uh, so without further ado, um, just uh, actually a reminder of kind of the procedures, which is that we, let, let's, let's all try to the extent that is possible to limit our interruptions of the presentation to clarification questions, although definitely clarification questions are encouraged, uh, but maybe the more extensive uh, give and take, let's keep for the question and answer at the end. Okay. Okay, so Stephanie, um, please, uh, please feel free to start. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you so much for the invitation. I'm really delighted to be here. Um, I hope everyone can see my screen. So I thought that today I can tell you a bit about uh, how we can leverage surveys and experiments to understand how people think about the economy and more specifically to answer macroeconomic questions. Um, so I have thought about this a lot in public economics and political economy, but I've come to believe that actually macroeconomics is a great area of application for these sort of methods. And so I'm going to combine um, a few projects that I've done to show you uh, what I think could be fruitful avenues and very much looking forward to your feedback. So the, re the reason that um, we are thinking of using large scale surveys and experiments is because there are many things that are actually invisible in other data no matter how great that data is. Um, and these are things like perceptions, attitudes, knowledge, views, understanding. And as economists, we're typically much more inclined to use revealed preference approaches, still so backing out preferences or constraints from observed behaviors. And we may even have some intrinsic distrust uh, of surveys or self-revealed, self-reported variables, especially if we think of the recent, you know, so controversies around electoral polls or old style surveys, which were used to measure things that today we can see much better in other data. And it's true that in principle, in many settings, we can write a full fledged model and then use um, observational data to back out what's invisible and tangible, but it's not, you know, it's not necessarily the best solution always. Sometimes it requires a lot of assumptions. Uh, sometimes it requires a lot of variation that we don't actually have in the real world. Uh, to identify our parameters. And it also requires a lot of isolated you know, situations which don't occur often. Um, you know, for instance, we're not asked to vote or express our preferences on many issues very often. And so a lot of policy also hinges on what we think others may do, um, higher order beliefs, things that are just very difficult to infer, which we won't necessarily express in our own behavior. And so, you know, I think that surveys are sometimes a much more direct way of eliciting these things. And of course, like other methods, they have some weaknesses, they have some strengths, and they're appropriate uh, if done, you know, with, in a very careful um, and cautious way. And so for the results to be reliable, a lot of work actually goes into the design, the careful calibration, and deploying these on appropriate samples. And so this is what I wanted to um, talk here about by illustrating with basically three applications that were recently done um, by me and co-authors uh, to apply to three different types of questions. So how can surveys be useful for macro questions? Um, three things that I see sort of immediately and perhaps there are many more. The first is to understand how people actually reason about policies. And here I'll, I'll illustrate it with fiscal policy, so tax policy. But um, I've, I've looked also at other things like health policy, climate change, trade, et cetera. And you know, this could be applied to many other settings too. The second big uh, question that one can you know, make progress on with these surveys is to see what people think about where they stand, how they perceive the economic world around them. So how do they rank relative to others? What do they know about their income and their position, for instance, in their firm, in their sector? This has implications for wage dynamics, wage bargaining, search, et cetera. And so I'll illustrate this with the project done in Denmark where we can match survey data to very high quality administrative data. And then the third type of application 
is to elicit directly, estimate key macro parameters that are otherwise difficult to get. Uh, because we lack the variation, because we lack the consumption data joined with assets data, joined with background data, etc. So without further ado, let me jump into the first point, which is that we can leverage these methods to see how people understand policies. And so I'll start with the example of tax policy. So a typical survey in these, in these understanding uh, economics uh, types of work is as follows. So we wanna put some, some structure of course on you know, what people's tax policy views should depend on. So we do have some mo model in the background and then we organize the survey around that model. So um, what I'm going to try to do here is to elicit what I view as the, all the relevant components that go into someone's view of taxes so these will be my sort of right-hand side variables, and then relate them to what people think about tax policy, that will be my left-hand side variable. And so the steps are represented here on that slide, you know, translate immediately into the blocks and the outline of the survey. And this will actually be a good occasion for me to tell you about some specific and perhaps a bit unusual methods that what can leverage that can be informative and useful. So first, in most surveys, respondents are asked about their socioeconomic background, for instance, their uh, income, their age, their political views, and then you adapt to whatever the question requires. So in the third project, for instance, I'll ask a lot about their credit cards, about their assets. Here, it's not as relevant, but instead what's very relevant perhaps is media consumption and exposure. Then comes something a little bit unusual, which is to ask people open-ended questions. Uh, so these are there to extract the first order thinking and considerations of respondents before priming them to think in one direction or the other. So it's to get a sense whether people's gut feeling, if you want, are at all in line with what we may consider are the major determinants of tax policy. And then I ask people factual knowledge. So for instance, about the income or wealth distribution, about what the tax system looks like, etc. So there's lots of questions here to see, do people know the parameters factually? After this actually comes apart, in which I show people uh, short Econ 101 courses on that policy. So for instance, on how the tax system works and see how it affects their reasoning. So I'll come back to this in a second. And after this, a deep dive is taken into this block called reasoning about taxes, where I'm going to try to see how people think about the efficiency costs, so the economic cost of taxes, the distributional impacts, and also what's very important, uh, for tax policy, the fairness concerns, which is basically how you're going to weight winners and losers of a policy. And so here is where there's going to be a drill down into very detailed things. Uh, you can almost think of it as a, you know, as a small problem set where you ask if, you know, if taxes are increased on the middle class or on top earners, what will happen? Will they save less? Uh, to what extent will they move states? To what extent will they be less entrepreneurial? So really all the things we may think about when we write our models as well. After that, I ask people about their policy views. So these are the outcomes, things like, do you support higher, lower, or what level of taxes on different groups? Um, is a progressive tax a good way to reduce inequality? Um, what about the way it's spent? Uh, what, if, what if it's to finance this or infrastructure or transfers to lower incomes, et cetera? Something I won't focus on here, but that turns out to be quite important is use of government because ultimately the government is the institution that collects the tax revenue and decides on the spending. But this is something that's also there at the end. And so to, you know, to recap, I'll basically try to relate policy views of people, which are my left side outcome variables to all these components here, to people's knowledge, to people's misperceptions, to people's efficiency, perceived effects, et cetera. So this will lead to a sort of decomposition of what people think the policy should be, what their views are on all these various factors. And of course, it would be great to establish some causality and to see what matters more. And this is where we can leverage some experimental variation. So let me show you how these videos look like. So these videos are actually going to explain the workings of tax policy, but again, could be trade, could be other policies in a neutral and balanced way, but focusing only on one aspect. So for instance, the redistribution treatment will only tell people about the redistribution benefits. So what's the income distribution? What does the progressive tax do? It sort of mechanically takes a bit from the top and then spreads it to the bottom through programs or transfers. Um, 
the efficiency treatment will only focus on the efficiency costs or consequences of taxes. So it's going to show people the fact that um, the economy will be affected when there's higher or lower taxes. These are, of course, just screenshots. In, in, in reality, these are videos that are, that are shown to people. And then tells people some ways in which this can happen. For instance, people uh, sorry, working less, not looking for a second job, evading, etc. And then the economist treatment will append these two videos together and also conclude with the trade-off between the two. So that's why it's called the economist treatment, because it will say, in the end, you know, the right level of tax is the balance between the economic costs and the benefits. Um, and um, it's about balancing these two uh, in that trade-off. So this is basically how this survey looks like. And um, I wanted to show you a few key results here, perhaps to, you know, to think about how this can apply to other policies or what we can learn from it. So I'll start with the open-ended uh, questions uh, and the text analysis that I do on them. So for those of you who work on text analysis, you know that there's always a lot of pre-cleaning and pre-processing of the data, uh, the details of which I'll spare you. But you can start with very simple things like looking at word clouds or looking at frequency distributions to see what topics people mention, what comes to people's minds when they're asked to talk about these policies. And so here's what comes to people's minds when they're asked, for instance, about the federal estate tax and what, in your view, is the major shortcoming of the U.S. Uh, estate tax, which, for those of you who are not familiar with it, is the tax that's paid on the transmission at death when someone dies. This is the total tax levied on all the wealth that they're going to pass on. So you see already that the major concern people have that comes out very clearly is that this is income that's already been taxed, that's been double taxed. And that will come up many times in different forms as well. But you can go a bit finer. Um, you can start looking at topic distributions that come up in the open-ended answers. So on this slide, it's actually frequency distributions of the topics uh, which are put above each panel. So when people are asked, what are your main concerns? What are your main considerations about the income tax? This is the topics that they mention. So the numbers represent how many times the topic is, appears in all the answers. And the frequency here are actually shown by political groups, you know, finely sliced between Clinton liberals in dark blue, all the way to Trump conservatives in red. And the topic names are given by me, so I don't expect people to use the word efficiency. Instead, this is to denote a, a group of words that belong to that topic. So for instance, the efficiency topic would be words like work less, work more, hurt the economy, destroy jobs, etc. And you can see that the open-ended uh, question answers very much make sense as gut reactions. So on the left, people tend to mention distribution topics quite a lot, and much, much less so on the right. People tend to mention government spending much more on the right. And then perhaps surprisingly, things like fairness is something fair, unfair, is very evenly distributed. So it's mentioned by people equally along the political spectrum. And one thing that we'll talk about a lot in this project is that fairness is very much in the eye of the beholder. So it means very different things to different people. Jumping into knowledge, factual knowledge. So Again, a few select variables out of the many that I, that I ask about. But again, something that shows us perhaps how people will reason and react to these policies uh, because of some misperception. So for instance, for the income tax, um, I show you some key parameters here. So the reality is always in orange and the perception, the average perception is in blue. And then the median is the black dotted line. So you can assess the skewness uh, in the distribution. So the variables are separated by topic. On the, in the first panel, it's what people know about the top tax rate, either today or in the 50s. And you can see that people are sort of accurate about today, but they mistakenly assume that the tax rate used to be similar back then, when in fact, the US had a much, much higher tax rate. And then on the right panel, it's quite striking how people tend to underestimate where the top tax bracket starts. So they think it kicks in much, much lower than it does. And so when they think about, should I support a higher top tax rate or not, with this misperception, they're likely to think that they will be affected by it potentially quite soon, given that they think it starts so much lower than it actually does. You know, similarly, just verbally for the estate tax, there's similarly very striking misperceptions where people overestimate the share of households that will pay the estate tax. They think it's around one third when it's less than one in thousand. 
And so that also has implications for how much they're going to support such a policy or not. If you wonder also who knows more, uh, just a few, you know, just a few stats here on the slide, which is that higher income respondents, perhaps reassuringly, are more aware of what's going on at the top. So they're more accurate about things like the top tax rate, the estate tax, etc. College educated respondents are much more accurate. And then there's what I call the polarization of reality, which is that even for these basic factual questions like what's the top tax rate, which is something you can Google, there is a polarization between Republicans and Democrats. So in general, Republicans tend to think taxes are already higher, more progressive, inequality is lower, has increased less than Democrats do. And it's important to note that no group is systematically more accurate, but there is always that systematic gap between the groups. So moving on, a few other um, results that we can find here is, for instance, what do people think about what the efficiency effects of taxes will be? Well, it depends very much on which side of the political spectrum you are. So will people stop working? Will people stop being entrepreneurial? Will people save less, etc.? Very much depends where you stand politically. So in general, Republicans tend to think that uh, both the middle class earners and high income earners will be much more responsive, much more elastic to taxes than Democrats uh, think. So they think people will work less, move states, stop working, have their spouse stop working, be less entrepreneurial. And then in general, there's this notion, just very briefly summarizing on the right, that whatever benefits higher incomes will be good for everyone. So if you cut taxes on higher incomes, that will be trickled down to everyone, everyone will benefit. On the other hand, if overall taxes are raised to finance more spending, everyone will lose. Um, so there's much more in the, in, the, in the paper, much more finer analysis, but this is just to give a sense of what sort of answers one can, one can get. And then I also ask very detailed questions about fairness, but that may not be the most important uh, thing here. Um, but if you're interested in how people think about the fairness of this, that's also incredibly different along, along the political spectrum. And so just to summarize the main findings here on tax policy, and it looks different for trade policy or health policy, is that if you end up trying to assess what's the most important mechanism that drives people's views, it turns out here it's very much fairness concerns and the perceived benefits of redistribution. Um, it's followed by government views, so that's also very predictive, how much you trust the government, how able you think the government is. But things like efficiency concerns, as we understand them, play a much more minor role. And that will be true in a correlation sense, but it will also be true in the experiment. You know, the, the economist video or the redistribution videos will very strongly shift people's views but the efficiency video will do nothing, neither negatively nor positively. And of course, that begs a question, which is, so, you know, how much can we say about fairness views? And we can describe them very well, but ultimately fairness is actually very much in the eye of the beholder and means very different things to different people. And the second major finding here that I already alluded to is that there are very large partisan gaps uh, on all, at all levels of reasoning. So not just in final policy views, we knew that, but also on the perceived efficiency effects, on the perceived distributional impacts, on the fairness. And even at the basic level of reality, there's a gap. So moving on to the second um, illustration of how we can apply this, what do people actually know about their own income and their position among others in society? So what we do in this project is to use a new method, which is to link survey data, very detailed survey data that we, you know, we design and that we run to very detailed administrative data from Denmark. So this allows us to have the sort of subjective views that people have, what's their income, what's their position, and again, the fairness views, which I won't focus on much here. And then objective things like what's their actual income in a very detailed way, what's their history of income, what shocks have happened to them, and then we can ask them about their reference groups and we can see where they actually stand among people with the same education, people in the same gender, people of the same cohort, people of the same sector, and even very fine groups such as their neighbors, people in the same uh, firm at work, their coworkers, people who are their former classmates. So we have the reality uh, thanks to the data and we also have people's perceptions on all of these things. And so what we're going to try to do is, you know, see how accurate people are and what sort of inequality actually matters to them. So let me show you a bit how we how we elicit these uh, these perceptions. So 
First, let's start with the example of your cohort. So this is someone who's born in 1970. And so we asked them, what do you think is the median income? And we've explained with an instructional video with showing a ladder and explaining what the median and what the 95th percentile are. What is the median for people born you know, in 1970 like you? And so people have to, have to give an estimate. And then we ask, okay, great. So now what about these other groups? And these are all customized to be the respondents' own groups. So what about people born in 1970 or men born in 1970, born in Copenhagen uh, with a master and PhD or who work in finance and insurance? So this is adapted to exactly this respondent who happens to be in this situation. And once the respondent answers, we then ask them, great. So now please rank yourself among all people who are born in 1970. So you remember this letter that we explained to you. Uh, tell us, where would you put yourself? So for instance, this person says they're at P70 among all those born in 1970. And so we go through all the groups like that, rank yourself among people in your education group, so say with a master and PhD here in your sector, et cetera. And so what do we actually find? Well, let's start with the uh, one of the key large reference groups, which is your cohort. And this slide will show the misperception or the perception that people have of the median income in their cohort of the 95th percentile, so the top earners in their cohort uh, by actual position. And we will benchmark this in the left panel against the error distribution of their own income and to see you know, how much more people are off or accurate relatively to their own income perception. So the middle panel here is the misperception of your me the median income in your cohort. So the x-axis is your actual true position in your cohort that we know. And the vertical axis on the left is the reported median by bins of actual position. Uh, we can look at it, uh, you know, we can see the average perception in that bin that's in red or the median perception in that bin that's in white. On the right vertical axis, it's the actual error. So it's the percent difference between the report and the actual median. So you see that people are not far off. They're actually quite accurate uh, when they're asked to assess the median of their cohort. Um, in fact, the errors are pretty small. And you can see it in the very left panel that you know, the own income has the smallest error, but the median is a bit more spread out, but is not that far off. But Stephanie, this is, yes. this is um, which, because you ask this for different comparison groups. Yes, so this is for the cohort, yes. So for people in your cohort born in 1970, what is the median income? Yes. Um, and then I'll show you for your education group, for your city, things like that, yes. And so the second finding is that the higher on your own position, the higher the perceived median. So you think others are more, you know, are more similar to you. So lower rank respondents underestimate the median, higher rank respondents overestimate it. And then at the, in the right panel, which shows you the, the P95 misperception, there you can see that people are less accurate, but still not, you know, still not terribly far off. Uh, it's just that at the top, for instance, people very much tend to, uh, you know, they tend to overestimate how rich others are instead of, instead of uh, being accurate. And now if we move to your own position, what do people think about their own position? So let's start with the left panel here. So the x-axis has your actual position again in your cohort, and then the vertical axis depicts your perceived position by bin. So again, the red is the average perceived by actual bin, and then the white one is the median. And so we can see this inverted S pattern. So respondents who are with lower positions tend to overestimate their rank. Those with higher positions tend to underestimate it. And the misperceptions are not super large, but they're quite systematic here. And to some extent, this is actually mechanical. So I think there's a, there's a broader lesson here because when you think of it at the bottom, you can only weakly overestimate your position. And at the top, you can only weakly underestimate it. And this creates a center bias uh, because actual, you know, actual percentiles are of course uniformly distributed, but perceived positions are not. And so if we re-rank people by perceived position, we can try to correct for this. So this is what's done on the right graph here. We're asking, is a respondent who's ranked at X in the perceived position distribution also ranked at X in the actual distribution? And the answer is almost yes. So the systematic misperceptions are now much lower 
this is one sort of rough way to correct for this perhaps mechanical center bias. And there is certainly still some mean reversion, but that's more likely to be a true mean reversion rather than mechanically because of how percentiles uh, are reported. Okay. And so what about the other groups? Uh, as Francesco asked, this was for the cohort, but what about the other groups? So we can similarly look here uh, by, you know, the median and 95th percentile of other groups like uh, your educational level, your sector, etc. So if we look at the left panel, each dot here represents one large reference group. So for instance, there are two dots for gender. One is men, one is women. Uh, there's one dot per sector. And then there's one dot for each education group. And then municipalities, since there's so many of them, they're binned into 10 groups by, by income. So the x-axis represents the actual median income in those groups. And then the vertical axis is the average perception of respondents who belong to that group of the median in their group. So people are quite accurate again. They are very much clustered around, around the 45 degree line. But if you look at the right panel, which shows you what people think about the top earners in their group, there you see that it's much less consistent. And in particular, and this is perhaps most interesting for us um, you know, to study, is that people are very inaccurate for their sector and for their education group. So the highest paid groups, like having a master and PhD or working in finance and insurance, those dots which are at the very bottom right, people are highest paid there and they really underestimate how highly paid others are. So they don't realize how much inequality there actually is in these groups. Okay, so another thing that could be interesting to look at is very much like we saw for the cohort, uh, where we saw your perceived position as a function of your actual position, we can do the same here for all these groups. And so this is again here um, showing where do people think they rank relative to where they actually rank. So let's just focus on the on the left panel here. Um, it's showing, you know, as a function of your actual position in each group, and each each line is for one reference group. So for instance, as a function of your actual position in your master and PhD group, where do you think you rank uh, on the on the y-axis? And you can see that it's very much the familiar inverted S shape, where people who are ranked lower tend to overestimate where they are, people who are ranked higher tend to underestimate where they are. So very similar, very consistent as for the cohort. And then the, the right panel does nothing else but to hold constant the point at which we, we, we look at you. So the x-axis here is always in the cohort. And then we look at your perceived position uh, relative to your actual position for all groups. So this is just to hold people constant. Uh, and so you see that people who are ranked lower in their cohort tend to overestimate their position across all reference groups, not just in the cohort. And in particular, you see again, it's the sector and education groups that are most problematic. You tend to really overestimate where you rank in your sector and among others with your education, when in fact there's, you know, you're much lower down than you think. We also do this sort of ranking and elicitation for small reference groups. What do I mean by that? For instance, your coworkers, you know, that could be a relatively small group. And so we ask people in a different way here, um, tell us, you know, your coworkers are people in the same workplace. How many are there? And then please, you know, you said there's, for instance, you have 50 coworkers, rank yourself from one to 50 among those coworkers. So this is all adaptive. It adapts to what people respond. And so this allows us to see what people think about smaller groups that are perhaps more salient to them. And so we ask this about coworkers. We ask this for neighbors uh, in your city, uh, in your street, sorry, or in your building. Uh, we ask this about your former schoolmates when you were 15, et cetera. And then we can look what people know. And what you will see here is very much, you know, sort of the equivalent to these large reference groups. So if you think that coworkers are the small scale equivalent of the sector, you can see a very similar pattern, which is that people are quite off when estimating their position relative to their coworkers. So even for people who work in the same firm, those who are paid less think they rank much higher than is actually the case. And those who are ranked you know, at the top, they're, they're a bit more accurate. They still underestimate a bit. In fact, people are much more accurate in predicting their position among their neighbors, which you can think of the equivalent of their municipality on a smaller scale, um, or even among their former schoolmates than among their coworkers. So that's quite striking. 
In the project, we also ask people how fair they think this inequality is and how much it matters to them and what they want to do about it, etc. We also show them where they truly rank and see what happens. But um, I'm not going to be able to cover all that. The only thing that I'll say is that people actually tend to really underestimate the inequalities that they think are most unfair. So they think that the most unfair inequalities are conditional on education and conditional on sector of work. Yet these are the places where they underestimate how much inequality there is. And I think this could have you know, implications for wage setting dynamics and for search uh, for within and between firm inequality if people are so badly informed exactly about those type of inequalities. Could it help explain some behaviors but also inform the acceptability of various policies or wage setting policies? Moving on to the final project, uh, very briefly. So yeah, Stephanie, can, can I just point out is, is we have 15 minutes left and uh, it's up to you how you want to use it. But uh, I'm sure that there's a lot of questions already pent up. Yes. So it's up to you, but uh, yeah. Perfect, I will, I'll need another, you know, five, six minutes to just cover this and, and then I can answer the questions. Um, so, the third, the, third, uh, the third project is to illustrate how we can estimate some key, some key macro parameters directly. And this is a bit different than the previous two. So you know, the idea is that um, we often lack other type of data or variation to get some of the things that are interesting. And here we're going to apply this to eliciting intertemporal marginal propensities to consume. Um, but in general, using surveys, what's possible is to make a more detailed heterogeneity analysis because you can ask people many relevant questions, for instance, about their background, their situation, their past shocks, et cetera. You can also ask them about higher order beliefs, which again, is something that we won't reveal with our behavior very easily. So how will others react? And that may be relevant for what they think will happen. We can put them in hypothetical situations for you know, cases where suitable real-world data is missing. And then we can also do experimental interventions where, for instance, we make something salient like uncertainty or negative downward potential for the US economy, et cetera. But what's very critical and what we're going to do here a lot is that to gain confidence in survey answers, we would like to have cross validations. So what we will do is to put people in situations that have been estimated in other work, um, in like many papers which estimate MPCs reactions to this shock, that shock, we're gonna put respondents in exactly that situation in the survey and ask them what they would do and then see, does it align with what we've estimated um, in other work, other people? And the answer is actually yes, like well-formulated questions can actually very much recover existing parameters, which then gives us the confidence to branch out and try to get parameters which we haven't been able to estimate yet. So that's the logic of this type of work here. And so, you know, what we're, what we're trying to do is simply to ask people how they're going to spend a given amount of money, what their MPCs are, and to especially be able to look at MPCs by different types of groups that we haven't been able to look at before necessarily due to lack of data. So what we're doing is to have this detailed survey where we ask people about their backgrounds, specifically also about their financial assets and liabilities, their own experience in the past, their expectations, we provide them with randomized information about the US economy outlook, you know, either very negative, very positive, or just uncertainty. So, um, uh, you know, symmetrically, but uncertainty. And then we ask them how they're going to spend a given amount of transfer and what their savings and spending plans are. And very importantly, as I mentioned, we're going to do a lot of cross validation, putting people exactly in the setting that they've been uh, studied in other papers to see if it aligns with what people find. And so to give you a brief, um, a brief idea how this works. So first, we're going to ask people, here's a one-time payment. And we're going to importantly randomize the size of the payment, the source of the payment, the duration of it, the horizon, the frequency with which we ask people, and whether it's anticipated, as in it happens in three months, or whether it happens today. So all these are going to be randomized so that we can get a lot of different uh, reaction parameters. And so people, once they get the size of their shock, they're asked to allocate it next quarter, in two quarters, three quarters, et cetera, between spending, between debt repayment, et cetera. So it will be a whole detailed series of questions like that to try and see, and everything will be adapting interactively so that people can make a plan and see what's left, what can I spend, et cetera. And so I think the two main strengths, and I'll, I'll finish with this, is first, 
that it's very important, as I said, to cross validate with existing work. So here's just a sample of the papers in the first column, the findings of which we can replicate by mimicking what these papers do to respondents, uh, whether it's NPCs or whether it's the share of hand to mouth households, uh, the share of committed expenditures. We can very well replicate actually what people find in these settings by asking the question exactly as it's studied in the paper. And then we can look at very detailed MPCs, for instance, quarterly uh, MPCs, um, and then and, and see how they line up with what we know, and then start slicing them by is the shock anticipated, is the shock unanticipated, so does it come in a quarter two, on quarter three, uh, and what about constrained versus unconstrained households, and you can see very well constrained households will spend things very much the moment it arrives, they're aware of that, others will start spending it in advance and smooth it out. So I, I, I'll try to answer questions on this if there are any, because I know that I rushed through these slides, but I think the key here is very much to make sure that the answers are valid by validating uh, relative to other work and then being able to actually branch out and estimate parameters that we could not get before. So thank you very much. I hope this was uh, informative for all the things I think one can do with these sort of tools and very much looking forward to your questions. Okay, thank you, Stephanie. I think um, maybe the easiest thing to um, do the uh, Q&A is if you raise your hand or uh, um, somehow signal. Uh, ah, by the way, first, first thing, Stephanie, maybe you can now um, uh, stop sharing so we can see more faces on the screen. Sure. Uh, that also will help me see if someone wants to raise a physical hand as opposed to a digital hand. Uh, but you know, uh, let me let me get started uh, as usual um, with what, my own quick question, which is uh, uh, well uh, uh, about the first paper, this stunning stunning irrelevance of efficiency considerations, which I thought mm. was the most most striking thing. You um, and it's particularly striking because uh, you know we economists have spent the last probably the last century uh, absolutely obsessing about the efficiency consequences of taxation. And we must have written literally billions of words about that. And, and then, now people say it's not an issue for them. Now, I, I wanted to ask you, uh, there, there are two ways of interpreting that, I think. One is that people do not think that there are particularly distortionary effects from taxation. Because if, if you believe that, if you believe that distortionary effects are not that big, then you're gonna say, well, efficiency is not a big consideration. Or they recognize, uh, or they believe there are distortionary effects, but if just efficiency for them is not such an important thing for the economy. It's much more important to have some kind of fairness, as you said, on distribution. So do you have a sense of which one of these two very different interpretation is, is, is more relevant? Yes, so first of all, to the point of we've been studying these effects, is it irrelevant? No, reality is what it is. And you know, reality doesn't go away because people you know, uh, don't put that much importance on it or something. So the reality is what it is. We know the efficiency costs in many different settings. We've estimated them. As you say, billions of words have been written on that. So that is what it is. Now, what do people actually perceive? So there's a bit of both. So there's a bit of the fact that people tend to perceive different efficiency responses from what we think. So for instance, something very salient that actually does not happen that much in, in, in the data is that people will move in response to taxes. It happens, but it's very small, yet it's super salient in people's minds, perhaps because of how it's advertised in the media when someone famous leaves for tax purposes, et cetera. Um, things like labor supply responses are not that salient at all in people's minds, um, especially, especially not when you ask them about themselves. Would you stop working uh, in response to taxes? Would you work less, et cetera? So there is definitely a, a saliency issue. But then it's also a relative statement that I made, which is that the, the fairness concerns, what people think is going to be fair and who will gain, who will lose, swamps the other considerations. So it's, the, it's just in, relative, in the relative terms, the most important consideration. So people are, are sort of willing to gloss over a lot of efficiency costs if they think it's going to lead to something that they perceive as fair. Uh, so that's the answer. It's about the weight between these two. So, but, but Stephanie, sorry, I, let, let me come back one second, and then I'll, I'll, I promise this is the last thing I say. Uh, you, you say that um, reality is reality, and, and what people perceptions maybe. May 
I mean, of, of those billions of words we have written about the inefficiency of taxation, you know, 99.9% .9 is theory. Uh, and in fact, I think, you know, empirically, uh, the evidence is pretty weak that these things, these, these distortions are, are very important. And let me ask you one thing. You, you finish up by saying, when you ask people uh, about how they behave in certain situations, that line up well with the estimated parameters. Now, people are telling you, you just said, that they, the labor supply would not be very sensitive to taxes. Why don't you want to believe them? Maybe that's true. Maybe people are not very responsive to taxes. And, and no, no, absolutely. Is, so yes, so I think we, I mean, we know actually a lot about many of these, uh, many of these responses. At least, you know, I pick taxes because it, it's it's my it's my major area, and there's a lot of empirical work. And in fact, on the intensive margin, labor supply elasticities are quite small, absolutely. Uh, and so it, it it's clear that when people say that, um, although they think that uh, they're larger for higher earners, or they think they're a little bit larger for others than for themselves, uh, there's a bit of a gap there. Yes, they they don't perceive them to be high. On the participation margin, they're much larger in reality, and and their people also don't 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 believe them to be. But some things which are very salient, as I said, like moving states or um, you know being less entrepreneurial, which we don't have much evidence that those are large effects. Those tend to be overblown. Now, it's also very important, like the contrast in, in the in these projects, and in particular, I tried to emphasize in the third project is um, in the third project. When I say we're cross-validating and, and we see that people actually respond very much in line with what's been estimated, we're really trying to put people exactly in the precise situation. So, you know, I don't want to pick on a particular paper, but you probably all know these papers eliciting various uh, MPCs or, um, or various hand-to-mouth behaviors, etc. We're literally trying to put people in that, in, that, in that same setting. So imagine you got this exact transfer um, imagine that uh, this else was happening and these were the constraints, what would you do? And then we can see that it actually lines up very well with what economists have estimated. So it is, it is not the case that when you ask people about stuff that's quite relevant to their life, that's not a huge extrapolation relative to their current situation, they can sort of predict what they will do. Now, if you ask them, what will a very rich person do um, if this happens and they've never been in that situation, you know, that's a big extrapolation. Or what will you happen if suddenly you became a millionaire? That's a very big extrapolation. And I would have much more, you know, much less confidence in that sort of answer, as opposed to if you got a thousand dollar check from the government, how would you spend it? Actually, you're very accurate given what we know uh, from past work. Uh, Luca Ricci. Hi, um, thanks a lot, Stephanie. This is a great presentation and I'm really a fan of, of your work in particular on the um, gap between perception and, and reality, which exposes most of the models. Models tend to rely on the ability of, of agents to, to capture reality fairly well. Uh, on that perspective, one question I have is, um, uh, how do you think about the determinants of the misperception, meaning, can we disentangle how much uh, the gap between perception and reality is due to phenomena that we cannot change, like culture, demographics, and stuff like that, versus factors we can try to influence? I don't know, their jobs or, or, or uh, their income distributions or other things like that. In, in, in your um, experience, um, can we disentangle non-movable and versus uh, policy actionable factors? Thanks. I think that's very important and it very much depends on the topic. So for tax policy, there's some really low hanging fruit here in the sense that, you know, not being aware of the basic tax system, where the top tax rate kicks in, what the top tax rate is, or even what, you know, basic income distributions are, to me, those are low hanging fruits. Explaining actual mechanisms um, is much more complex, of course, like what will happen, you know, as, as, as Francesco said, perhaps even we have quite a bit of doubts on many of these. But then there's topics, I didn't cover them here, uh, but for instance, immigration, which I've worked on, where there's so many entrenched narratives and it's actually a very politically divided issue too, that there is a mistrust of any information that you get. So there I would say it's hard to even, even correct basic facts such as you know very plainly, what's the share of immigrants in your country? Um, there's a mistrust of even that sort of basic information. 
So I think it depends very much on the on the issue at hand. But I think there's some low hanging fruit and then some less low hanging fruit, but that would still be very worthwhile to try and and, and improve. Laura Alfaro. Uh, hi, um, as, as always, a great presentation and, and very influential work. I, I have perhaps a, a little bit more detailed questions. Um, so when you ask things, it depends a lot on how you ask them. And, and so, for example, if you ask, do you care about this policy, it's very different relative to you ask people, please rank the importance of these policies. And, and also, as you said, fairness is on the eye of the beholder. Some people may consider it unfair that they work very hard all their life and get taxed, while someone that they see not perhaps working as hard gets a subsidy. And again, who am I to judge? So, but on top of that, and these posters know a lot, perceptions are volatile. Mm -hmm. So, so um, so how do you dis disentangle those two things? There is that how you ask may trigger different things. But also if I ask today relative to what I have asked tomorrow, it, it may change out of, um, again, just, just moods. And in particular, some of these policy questions do, do, do people do change a lot in, in terms of uh, perception. Yeah, now these are excellent points. So there's at least three of them here. So very, very good questions. On the framing and how you ask, it absolutely matters. And um, you know, I could I could go on for for quite a long time for um, if you're trying to get a more accurate, neutral answer. What sort of techniques you can apply? As simply as not asking, do you care, but rather, you know, how much do you care? And or ranking exactly things that are much less in one direction, but much more neutral, so that people could take either stance on that issue. Uh, so there's a lot of methods developed also by psychologists on how to ask these, and we're trying to always improve them. Um, what's also the case is that uh, sometimes the framing is actually very interesting because per se, it's almost like a treatment, as in priming people in one particular way, uh, very subtly, is almost like making a salience of something stronger or, or weaker, and that's actually an effect to estimate. So in the last project, for instance, the horizon with which you ask will very much make people think about the future or make them behave more myopically. And that's a meaningful frame in a sense. It's, it's teaching us something about how people reason. On the stability of it, absolutely. And so in general, think of it as having large samples where these sort of personal current situations may be averaged out, like say the mood is sort of averaged out. And you may look at people by income groups overall or by age group or by gender group. You're not looking at the noise of one particular respondent. So those sort of things could be averaged out. But then I agree with you that actual variation over time could be also very meaningful. So we see very well that people react to events that make something more salient or not. So you can very much, you know, use survey in combination with real world data of what's going on or real world news. And that's also very informative. The average, the noise is sort of averaged out, but meaningful time changes can be, can be very much leveraged. Um, and then what's fair, what's not fair, absolutely. So. I didn't have time to cover this year. It's actually the core of that of that project, uh, which is what we care a lot about in public econ. It's actually to ask people very detailed questions to try to see what's fair to them. So um, as simple as are people in general entitled to their income? Uh, you know, is income mostly due to effort, due to luck? What do you think about someone whose parents were, were rich? What chances did they have relative to others? So actually trying to drill down in a very detailed way uh, both about what people think the process is behind income and then how fair they think a given outcome is. So many more questions there, but I agree with you completely. Fairness is, is just something to drill down on with very detailed uh, considerations like that. So thank you. Okay. Um, I, so we need to kind of formally conclude the session, um, but the next session starts in 11 minutes. So I suggest uh, uh, Stephanie, if you don't mind sticking around for into things that haven't actually uh, been measured like that. Exactly. I would love to talk more. Thank you. Sure. Thanks a lot. Great talk. Thanks. Good to see you. Good to see you. Thank you so much for all the great comments and questions. Um, and thank you for the invitation.
Thank you, Stephanie. Thank you for uh, for, the, for a great great keynote and uh, for coming. We, we hope you can stick around for for the rest of the day. Absolutely. Uh, okay. So we have, we have a couple of minutes away from the beginning of this of this um, the next the next section. Um, so I think Federica, if you want to start uh, sharing your screen. Um, Okay. Can you see? Yeah. Perfect. Uh, Francesco, your audio is buffering. I don't know if it's only me, but. Uh... Yeah, I think it's buffering. So. I am so sorry. I keep forgetting to put on the, the mic. Uh, I was just saying, let's uh, let's give people a couple of minutes to come back from the from the kitchen or other places. Hmm. Okay, uh, Federica, if you're ready, I think we can uh, we can start with the with the session. Okay, so first of all, thank you very much uh, for giving us the opportunity to present uh, our paper in this session. So I mean, we're very excited. And second, uh, I mean, if you have like clarification question, you can also ask in the chat. Uh, and two very nice men that are like Sergio and Kurt will be happy also to reply to your clarification question or I can also reply. And then third, let's go to the project. So this is like a second paper on a broader agenda that uh, Sergio and Kurt and I have together and is to push the study of heterogeneity in the context of uh, international macroeconomics. So the title of the paper, where does capital flow uh, from equal to unequal countries, uh, should in some sense, uh, you should react to this title by saying, uh, what are you saying, right? Because we don't know this fact and we don't know how inequality uh, affects capital flow. So the first thing that we do in this paper is to provide and document some, some evidence of a negative correlation between current account and income inequality. So what we do here, and this is the first step, but it's very simple, is that we plot on the horizontal line income inequality and on the vertical line is current account balance to GDP ratio. We take an average from 97 to 2007, so it's a 10 years average, mostly because we are interested in long run effect. And we pick this period because it was a period in which there was a lot of capital flow across country. And also for this presentation, we are mainly focused on the advanced economies. So here we're not, I mean, I'm going to show a result for the merging, but our presentation and model is mostly focused on advanced economy. And every economy, I mean, you can see every country that different size. And the reason why we have different size is that we weight the regression with the uh, GDP of each country. So for this reason, US is very big and for example, Norway is smaller. And yet you can see that there is a strong negative correlation between current account balance to GDP ratio and income inequality. By the way, income inequality, I think I missed to say, is a genie on income net of taxation. So what, sorry, what we do in this paper? So in this paper, we do three things. So this paper is based on three pillars. The first one is to document this negative relationship between inequality and capital flows. And then we are right to say that is a negative relationship when you look at the cross section between inequality and domestic savings. So the second part of the paper is to develop an open economy, general equilibrium model, that is an analytical model in this case, in order to rationalize the empirical findings. And the third part of the project, but still this is an ongoing part, is to write a quantitative model that is that can give you the discipline and uh, can discipline, sorry, the strength of the channel that we are highlight in the simple model. So today we're going to present one and two. So in the next two slides, I'm going to present the result. Then after this, all the presentation is just an iteration of the two results. So the first part is the empirical result. What we found is that in the advanced economies, 
income inequality is ne negative correlated with current account balance. And this is what we show so far. Then we know that a big part of current account balance is trade balance, especially among the advanced economy. So we ran our regression and we found that there is a negative correlation between income inequality and trade balance. Then we go one step further and we know that trade balance is aggregate saving net of aggregate investment from the national account. So we redo our regression and we found that there is a negative correlation between aggregate saving and income inequality. And finally, we divide aggregate saving in private and public savings, and we show that this negative correlation is a negative correlation between income inequality and private saving, not public saving. So overall, what we found is that countries that have high income inequality, they tend to have lower private saving than countries. Sorry, countries that have high income inequality tend to have low private saving with respect to country with low income inequality. And since, uh, I mean, we would like to have more data, but we cannot come with, we cannot state any causal effect. So we wrote a model that can account for this fact. So with respect to the model, the first question is that, can we take a standard diagonal model, put some income process and match this fact? And the main answer to this question is no. And the reason why we cannot have something like that is that in the Ayagari model or in whatever model you want to think that is a standard or a genius agent model, you can have high income inequality or you can have more income inequality or you can have income inequality for two reasons. So the first one is that there is some idiosyncratic risk, right? Or some um, income risk. Then in this case, this model predicts that if you have a higher uninsurable income risk, then you're going to have higher precautionary saving, right? And this means that if we take an Ayagari model, we should find that country with a high income inequality, if income inequality is explained by uh, uninsurable income risk, then should have a higher uh, aggregate saving, right? This is what the model predicts. Then you can say, okay, but no, all the income inequality is explained by the permanent component, not by the income risk. And then in this case, if you think that it's the permanent component, this permanent component should not change the uh, saving decision of the household because mostly, right, the permanent component is a permanent shock and so shouldn't change uh, your saving decision. So what we would expect if all the income inequality is explained by the uh, permanent component is that aggregate saving and income inequality should be uncorrelated. So the standard Yagari model would predict either a positive correlation or a flat co or no correlation, but for sure not a negative correlation. So one important feature of, the, uh, of this model that we think is giving uh, um, this result is the presence of exogenous incomplete market. Okay, so what we do in this paper, we allow to have endogenous incomplete market. So we say, okay, we take an Yagari model but we allow for household to default. We see household can default in this model. And if they default, they're going to be relegated to autarky. So, and in this case, what we have? In this case, we have like that uh, the income process in the country matters for your default decision, right? Because if you default, you're going to be relegated to, to autarky. And in this case, if you assume that, so if you live in a country where there is a lot of income risk, also high income risk, then outer key is not a nice equilibrium for you, right? You don't want to end up in outer key. And for this reason, households are going to be less likely to default or households are going to default for a high level of the debt. This means that the financial market can ensure more risk sharing across the household. And this means that in equilibrium there's going to be higher borrowing especially if, we, if you consider a close economy perspective. So there's going to be higher borrowing and a high interest rate, right? Because markets are going to be closed, financial market to complete financial market. If instead you live in a country with, in which you have low income inequality, think that you're living, for example, in Sweden or in the Scandinavian country, then in this case, outer key is not a bad equilibrium, right? Because outer key means that you're living in a world in which the income risk is not very high. And for this reason, households are going to be more likely to default. 
And this means that the financial market can uh, enforce less risk sharing across the household because households are going to default for lower level of the debt. So in this country, there's going to be lower borrowing and also lower interest rate because the interest rate in some sense is a signal of the market completeness. So here, what we say is that in countries which have a high income inequality, there's going to be a, a very high interest rate. And in countries with low income inequality, you're going to have low interest rate if we consider the growth economy. So what does happen if we open the financial market? Then in this case, capital are going to flow from low interest rate country to high interest rate country. And in our context, this means that capital are going to flow from equal to unequal, unequal countries. So this is just the literature and I'm going to skip this slide. So the first part is I'm going to present the empirical findings and then I'm going to present the model. So the empirical findings. For the simple, we think uh, we divide the, our data set. So we take all the data for all the country in the world that are available and we divided our data set in advanced, emerging and poor economies following a category of the World Bank. Unfortunately, the data for the poor economies or less developed economies are not available in the, for the income inequality, so we're not going to present data uh, for them. We excluded the tax havens, and the main reason is that there is a huge literature that shows that tax heaven, they have a very strange capital flow, and we don't want to, to enter like in this debate. So for the inequality, we take Gini index for income net of taxation from a new data set that is this data set from the United Nations. And this data set put a lot of effort to have comparable measure of income inequality across different countries. <coughs> Sorry. And for the national account, we take, so the measure for the national account, we take some standard data. So the government account balance from schmidt grodor the database, public savings from the World Economic Outlook and the population by age from the United Nations and GDP in US dollar from the data set of Lane and Milesi Ferretti. So the empirical analysis is super simple. So we're not going to do some fancy econometric analysis. So we define a country like I, we define a group like J. So and in our data set, we have advanced and emerging. And again, we have less developed, but we're not going to show the result because we don't have result for them. We have a continent, so we define C as a continent and YI is the dependent variable. We define YI as a general dependent variable because we're going to change YI during the, the presentation. And Gini, that is uh, our uh, independent variable, is the average of Gini net of income from 97 to 2007. So we run two different regression, one for the advanced and one uh, for the merging in which we have a continent fixed effect, then we have a sort of a group fixed effect, and then we have BJ that is the coefficient of Gini, right? And then we use some, some controls and these are the standard controls and this is just an error. So what we control for, we control for GDP per capita and an average from 97 to 2007. We did something similar with the growth rate and nothing changed. We use an average uh, of all dependency, all the age dependency ratio. So something that can control for the demo demographic because this is a very important measure or variable both for capital flow and for income inequality. And we also take into account the size of the government. I, again, we take an average of the size of the government from 97 to 2007. We use a dummy for oil exporter and we use a dummy for um, mineral exporter. And all the regression are weighted with the GDP of each country, US dollar from 97. So this is an average from 97 to 2007. So this is like the slide that I present at the beginning of the presentation. And the only difference is that here is, a, I mean, it, these are the residual of the regression in some sense. So this is a sort of more robust regression. Again, here there is the income inequality and on the vertical axis, there is current account to GDP, uh, current account balance to GDP ratio. And they're both average from 97 to 2007. And you can see that the relationship is still negative. To be honest, the reason why things seems a little bit odd is just our model is not a very good explainer or the linear model is not a good explainer of Israel. So Israel is here 
and is a little bit at odd, but the slope of this line is very similar, is very much similar to the slope of the line that we presented at the beginning. If we look at the emerging market or the emerging economies, we don't find uh, any effect. But one of the main reasons is that we think also that this group is very disomogeneous. And in some sense, it's like advanced economy and all the rest. Now, since we don't have much time, I'm going just to focus on the advanced economy. The results for the emerging economies are going to be there. And if we want, we can comment after. So here, what we show is the coefficient of Gini for the regression on current account to GDP ratio. And you can see that the coefficient is negative, the magnitude is big and is significant. So it seems that there is a, a sort of negative correlation between income inequality. So Gini goes from one to, from one to 100 and to the current account uh, to, the G, uh, to the current account to the, GP, to the GDP ratio. Okay. Second point. So now we want to understand where this uh, uh, negative correlation comes from. So the first thing that we do is that we know that current account can be rewritten as trade balance plus return on asset held abroad. So we have data for trade balance. So what we did is like we change our dependent variable and we put trade balance instead of current account. And again, we found that the correlation is negative is big because it's minus one and it increases in magnitude. So it seems that again, there is a negative correlation between trade balance to GDP and income inequality when we look at advanced economy. Then by using the national account, we know that output is consumption plus public expenditure plus investment plus trade balance. So we can rewrite the trade balance as aggregate saving net of aggregate investment. So what we do, we run two different regression, one on aggregate saving on income inequality and the second using investment. And what we would expect is that either there is a negative correlation between savings, aggregate savings and income inequality, or there is a positive correlation between investment and income inequality. So here, for the advanced economy, what we found is that it seemed that there is even a stronger negative correlation between aggregate saving and income inequality. And for investment, we found a negative correlation, but the fact is that it's not significant. So we are going to focus on aggregate saving. Finally, we can divide aggregate saving in two parts. One is private saving, and the second is public saving. So we run the regression on private saving and public saving. And what we found is that it seemed that when we look at the cross section for the advanced economy, there is a negative correlation between private saving and income inequality, right? But not with public saving. So our result is robust to different things. First of all, some of you can see, okay, but you have the US, right? And US has exorbitant privilege. We know that there was this uh, saving glut. So it's like maybe everything is explained by the US. So we exclude the US from the regression. We still have similar result. We exclude China, but this is not important because we're not speaking about emerging country. We just focus on the European country. So we say, okay, let's take out all the advanced e economy, but let's focus on the European countries. And we found exactly the same result. We also at a certain point, uh, take the advanced economy and take out the, the European country that joined the monetary union. And the main reason is that uh, maybe they, they just have capital flow across this country. And this was driven by the, the fact that they joined the monetary union. Still, we get the same result. And also, we analyze different time span. So maybe we just cherry pick 97 to 2007. Maybe if we would pick 98 to 2008, we wouldn't find the same result. And it seems that the result is robust to different time span. So overall, what we find in our empirical analysis is that there is, a, if we look at advanced economies or advanced countries, inequality is significantly, significantly negative correlated with current account balance to GDP ratio, trade balance, aggregate saving, and private saving. Meaning that when we look at the gross section, country with a high income inequality, they tend to have lower private saving than country with uh, low income inequality. So the main question here is what drives this fact? So 
to understand what are the main the factor that can drive this fact, we, we wrote a model, I mean, we, we, we use a model. So first of all, why do we need a new model? Why don't we take a standard model, plug in our like income process and then get the result that we want? So apparently our finding are at odds with the, with the prediction of the standard Yagari, Bewley, Hug and so on model, right? And the main reason is the following. Within this model, if you think that all the income inequality is driven by different impermanent income, so you may think is we then, if you are a bus driver or a professor of economics, you have a certain wage gap. If you live in the US and the UK, this wage gap is much higher. But in this case, since it's a permanent component, this shouldn't affect the aggregate saving. So what we would find in this case is a sort of flat correlation between income inequality and, and aggregate saving. A second possibility is like, okay, everything is income risk, right? So in the UK, you have a lot of income risk. So if you're going to lose your job, then your decrease in the wage is going to be huge. Why is that if you would live in Sweden and you're going to move from one university to the others, then the difference in wage is not going to be so big. So in this case, what the standard Yagari model would predict is that country with a high income risk, right? They need to save more because there is more precautionary saving motive. So what we would expect to find in the data is a positive correlation between income inequality and aggregate saving. But it's not what we found. We found exactly the opposite. So we think that the reason, no, we think, like a reason why you get this result is that you have precautionary saving, but you have also the presence of an exogenous borrowing constraint. And this is the reason why you get uh, the, the result in the standard Yagari model. So what we do in this paper is by building on a traditional model like that exists in the literature, we allow for the presence of an endogenous borrowing constraint. And we show that by having this endogenous borrowing constraint, the result in the Yagari model can be uh, different with respect to the Yagari model. So the environment, what we have is like, uh, we assume that we have just two country. So I is indexed for the country, we have country one and country two. There is an endowment economy with one homogeneous good. So this is a good that could be traded across country. And we assume that within each economy, there are two types of household, right? So and we index household with J. Also can be H or can be L. Now H stands for high. So if you are, each guy, today is you're the lucky guy that has high endowment. So you're going to get Y that you can see as a sort of permanent component times a shock that is one plus epsilon I. If you said you're L, you're low, so you're like the unlucky guy that is going to get the negative shock. So you're going to get Y, one minus epsilon I. We assume that there is a lifetime utility that is a standard and your consumption depend on the type that you are so you can be high and low, and the country where you live, right? Because the shock depends on the country where you live. So this is the reason why you index CI, and then there is T that is time. So we assume that uh, the endowment process is persistent. However, you can change your type. And here we, we make a sort of easy assumption that is there is an aggregate shock, and with probability pi, no household are going to change your type. Right? So you're born high. So you, yesterday you were high. You wake up today, you are high again with probability pi. And with probability one minus pi, all the households are going to change uh, their type. And in this model, epsilon i capture the degree of income inequality in country i. Right? If epsilon i is equal to one, then you have a huge income inequality. If epsilon i is equal to zero, you don't have any income inequality. So first we're going to focus on closed economy uh, model. And for the one of you that know the model by Kruger and Perry, this is exactly a simple version of the model of Kruger and Perry. So the closed economy is like what we do there. We solve the problem of a benevolent social planner whose objective is to maximize the sum of the welfare of two households, so high and low, subject to the following constraint. So there is an incentive compatibility constraint because each household in every moment can refuse to make the transfer to the other household. If this happens, 
this household is going to be revert forever to other key, right? So imagine that you have the high guy, then the social planner say, give the resources to the other guy. If you say no, you're going to be in other key forever. This means that the household welfare should be at least as high as the one that they would receive in other key, right? Otherwise, the, the household has an incentive to say, no, I'm going to move to other key. And here we're going to focus on symmetric allocation following uh, uh, Kruger and Perry. So this is an allocation in which uh, it is enough for the social planner to know what is your state today. And it's not important to know the history of what happened in the, in, in the past. So, so here the social planner is going to give to the household J, the consumption CJ. And this is going to be a permanent component is Y and plus one plus epsilon tilde J. Right, where we are, we not assume, but we just use a resource constraint that to say whatever resources the um, social planner is taking from the low guy, so epsilon t the L should be rebated to the H guy. Right, there is nothing waste in this economy, and in this case, epsilon tilde right is going to be the degree of consumption inequality of consumption risk. So bear in mind that in this model, income risk is epsilon can be different from consumption risk at this epsilon tilde, right? Because the social planner can improve the equilibrium of the economy. So here, just the math problem, I'm going to move to give you the um, graphical solution. So here, what we have, we have on the vertical axis, the amount of consumption inequality, so epsilon tilde. And on the vertical axis, we have the value function or the welfare function of the different households. We assume that we live in an economy. So that is, uh, in this economy, the amount of income inequality is, is this epsilon, right? And this is the value function of the outer key for the H guy with this amount of income inequality. Okay, this is the reason why here you have VH outer key. So, we live in this world where there is this income inequality and the H guy is going to get this value function if he's going to be uh, moved to other key. Now, we're going to draw the value function of the H guy as a function of consumption inequality. So there is an area in which if the H guy is going to get more consumption inequality, it's going to be better off. Why? Because consumption inequality means that the social planner is taking resources from the low guy and is giving these resources to the H guy. So for this reason, there is an area between zero and what we call epsilon star in which the value function or the welfare function for the H guy is increasing, right? Then after epsilon star, so if there is too much consumption risk, then the H guy knows that in the future, he can become the low guy, right? So having a lot of consumption inequality is detrimental for him. For this reason, there is a point in which this uh, welfare function is going to decrease, right? So, and here, what you can see, we, we can see what is the solution for the social planner. So the social planner knows that the uh, welfare, the, the value function in outer key for the H guy is going to be this one. And so the social planner know that all the points that are above this line are feasible for him, right? So because the H guy is going to be better off, or at least I mean, is going to be, he will agree to uh, to all this point, right? So the social planner, what he want to do, he want to minimize the amount of consumption inequality. So what he's going to pick is going to pick this amount of consumption inequality that we call epsilon till the outer key, right? Let's think another possible experiment. Let's think that we live in a world where we have a lot of income risk, right? Epsilon bar. And this income risk is associated with this value function here, right? So think that this is the amount of income risk of another country and is associated with this value function in outer key for the H guy. Now, in this case, the social planner can actually pick all this point here so the social planner can actually achieve, right? And a consumption risk is equal to uh, zero. This is the reason why we, we call this welfare function, welfare function FB, the stand for the first best. So here we have three possibilities. If, if the income risk is between zero and epsilon star, then the social planner cannot do anything. And the reason why he cannot do anything is that he cannot improve the income risk. 
If the income risk is between epsilon star and epsilon bar, then the highest is the income risk, the more the social planner can improve the consumption risk, right? Because you can always be moving the other area. And then if the income risk is above epsilon bar, the social planner will be able to restore the first best. And for the log i, so here just we brought for the value function for the log i, you can see that this is decreasing in amount of the consumption risk. So whenever the social planner would be able to decrease the consumption risk, it's going to be better off. So here yeah, just a word what we said before is that in this model, if you have low income inequality, then there's going to be not, not risk sharing across the household. And you can think that this is a decentralized economy in which the borrowing constraint is going to be a zero and there's going to be a very low risk free rate. Instead, in this model, if you have the medium income inequality, then there's going to be some risk sharing across the household. So the borrowing cost rate slackness and the interest rate are going to be increasing in the amount of income inequality. So the highest is the income inequality, right? The lower is going to be the consumption risk. And then if you live instead in a world in which you have very high income inequality, then the social plan is going to be able to restore full risk sharing. And this means that there's going to be complete financial market. It will exist a borrowing constraint, but the borrowing constraint will never bind in equilibrium. And it's going to be a very high risk free rate. So in one minute, I'm going to give you the flavor of the open economy and what we find in the open economy. So in the open economy, we think that there is a, a social planner again, but in this case, the social planner is not maximize the welfare of the two households living in one country, but it's going to maximize the welfare of the, all the households living in all the country. All the households are still uh, subject to an incentive compatibility constraint. We give an extra instrument to the social planner. So the social planner is going to uh, improve, I mean, maximize the, the, the welfare and they can use uh, this uh, epsilon tilde, so the consumption risk within a country, but you can also move resources across the two countries. So you can move resources from country one to country two or vice versa. So here, uh, an equilibrium result is that the amount of consumption risk within each country should be exactly identical, and this is due to some arbitrage condition. And Instead, what we impose, but it's not a big imposition, is that all the resources that the social planet takes from one country they need to be rebated to the second country. So here, just in one second, they, what are the results? We look at the decentralized uh, economy just to give you the intuition of the result is that in the closed economy, country have different interest rate. So if you have very, a country with a very high income inequality, in our model, you're going to have a very high interest rate. If instead you are a country with low income inequality, then most likely you're going to have a low interest rate because your financial market are less developed. And in this case, when we open the financial market, country, sorry, capital are going to flow from low interest rate country to high interest rate country. And in our context is from equal to unequal country. So in the city state, so what we look at, we look at the city state, this means that we prove that high inequality countries owe debt and they have this tau that is negative, right? Because they owe debt and they pay the interest rate on this debt. Instead, low income inequality country, they owe the external asset and they have this tau that is greater than zero. So in this case, we're just looking at the long run equilibrium. So what we do is like in our model, is just we look at the city state where you, you are in a closed economy. And then we look at the city state once that you are, we open the financial market and we found that these two effects are there. So that in the new city state, high income inequality country are going to have a tau that is negative and low income inequality country are going to have a tau that is positive. And then we infer that there is a transition period in which capital are going to flow from equal to an equal country. So to conclude, we present new empirical fact, and this new empirical fact, uh, in some sense, are very good cool in the sense that inequality is negative correlated with current account balance to GDP ratio, trade balance to GDP ratio, aggregate saving, and especially private savings to GDP. We build a model that can rationalize this fact, and the key message is that inequality matters for the development of financial market. And now the next step is to go to a quantitative model that can, in some sense, 
tell, tell us what is the strength of the channel that we highlight in the simple model. So I finish here and also stop to share. <sighs> Thank you, Federica. Hands up. Mine is there. Perfect. Yeah. Okay, very nice. Thank you for this quick question. So your your savings are flow savings, right? Yes. Um, but I thought this line of reasoning would also have implications for stocks, um, in particular net asset positions and perhaps even central bank reserves. Do you have anything to say about that? So, so far, this is a good question, right? So we can look outside the net foreign asset position and see whether that is important. The only problem with the net foreign asset position that we had so far is that there is a huge devaluation effect there, right? So in some sense, if we look at the average of the current account to GDP ratio, you may think that this is a sort of cumulative, right? So of the depth that you have net of the devaluation effect. So we were thinking to use net, the short answer is that we were thinking to use net foreign asset position, but we want the net foreign asset position that are like, uh, uh, that, that they don't give us uh, the devaluation effect that are there. So we're trying to look for a measure that can give us our, not our story, but can, can be a good measure for that. And we didn't find so far. This is, yeah. Fadi? Hi, Federica, very, very nice paper. I, so your model has predictions, not, not just you know, about the, uh, the level of the current account or the current account balance and inequality, but also on the, on the flows between types of countries. So the question is, you know, if in reduced form you have tried some gravity model of bilateral capital flows where you also plug in an inequality variable to see whether inequality can, can indeed capture also like, you know, the flows between uh, any from an equal, from equal to unequal countries, as, as you suggested. So we didn't try any gravity model. I don't know if like Kurt or Sergio want to, but I think the short answer is that so far we didn't try. So it's like, we just tried this model and we tried a different kind of model, but we didn't find any model that could predict the effect that we have. I don't know if you have some other model in mind. Oh, it's, it's, a, it's a suggestion, take it as a suggestion. Given the implications of your model, it would be nice to see some you know, empirical evidence about a DAO's, these, these flows from, from equal to, 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 to unequal countries, not, not just on the, on the level of the current account. Yeah, it's basically going from cross-section to, you know, to cross-section where one country shows up once to a bilateral. Uh, okay. Now, now I got it to what you mean. Sorry, it's like, so it's more an empirical analysis than it's like, uh, so yeah. like just look at the input output table and just look whether the trade, yeah, that, that could be something that we can, Try to do like and see what happens. Sorry, I was thinking more about the, of the mechanism just, just to, to make your point stronger. Yeah. Robert. Well, I would say just one thing to Buddy's question. I mean, the title is maybe a little bit miss, like, I think we're more interested in the slope than the level, right? So you could imagine that, like, all of the savings is coming from China and there's more is going to the US than Sweden. Like, we would, I think our story would be completely consistent with that. So that maybe looking at Sweden, US bilateral flows, you know, we would find nothing, but it's really that, you know, all the savings is coming from China and, you know, the US is borrowing more from China than it is from, uh, than Sweden is borrowing from China, kind of on a, you know, by GDP. I think, you know, so I think we really have more to say about the slope than necessarily the fact that the US is negative and Sweden is positive. But what, so, sorry, what, what, can I, why do you say that? Because your model is prediction not only for who receives the flows, but also for who sends the flows. So I, I think Fadi is spot on because that would allow you to, uh, to test both uh, the channels. I mean, the, you put in a regression, uh, both the, you know, you have a regression for capital flows and you put in both the sending country and the receiving country, uh, like in trade models. And then you, um, you put in the inequality of the sending country, the inequality of the receiving country. I mean, I'm just repeating Fadi's point here, but it seems like uh, it's, uh, it's, it's sticking much closer to, you know, the model the prediction for both. So I don't know why you should say that you focus only on the receiving country. Anyway, Robert was waiting for. Robert, you're muted. Unless, unless you allow for, for bubbles or, or Ponzi schemes, uh, it's impossible for countries to run 
really permanent uh, current account deficits because otherwise, uh, you know, uh, the current account is a change of NFA, uh, permanent current account deficit would really mean that the NFA ex explodes. And, and so this means that unless you are in a bubble world, which I, I think uh, you're not assuming in, in your, your theory, the, the unconditional long-term mean of the current account has to equal zero. And actually, historically, you know, surely, and now the U.S. is running huge deficits, but, uh, you know, uh, between World War I and, uh, and, 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 you know, the uh, uh, early 80s, the U.S. was running surpluses, and before that, you know, the U.S. was, was a deficit country. So, so I think the idea that the current account in the long term is, is zero on average is, is plausible. But this then means that unless inequality itself is time-varying, the, the unconditional correlation between the current account and inequality has to equal zero. So, so uh, my question is, uh, are your results, so, so this suggests that the results are probably, your empirical results are probably uh, really contingent on, on having a very particular historical sample. I mean, if you really look at the long-term correlation, uh, it, it probably is, is, is very low. Um, and in terms of theory, do you actually need uh, time varying uh, inequality to 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 drive uh, the, the current account fluctuations. Yeah, I think like that is an excellent point. So it's like the the, the experiment that we, so you're right that in the long run, like think like 50 years from now, maybe it's like we cannot have a current account. Current account should go to zero, right? You're perfectly right. But we can think that the transition is like okay in the 80s or like around the 80s there was this opening of the international market. And in the meanwhile, what is also important is that inequality, the relative inequality across country change, right? Because if the inequality change exactly in the same way in all the country, I don't think we're going to get anything similar. But what is important is that you can have like some inequality, I don't know, US is increasing inequality with respect to Sweden. So once that you open um, a capital market, as, as long as you don't arrive to a city state, you still have some, cur some current account that is going to be positive or negative. But eventually, 50 mm -hmm. years from now, let's think that is a city state which inequality is a number for the US and a number for Sweden, then we should approach to a city state which current account is going to be. But, but, but this means that in your, in your theory, uh, to account for, for, the, for the data in a particular time sample, like 10 years or 20 years, as you, as you consider, you actually need a mechanism through which inequality is changing over time, right? And I didn't see that in, in your model. The first experiment that we have in mind is like the opening of financial market, that you have like some movement, right? And then, I mean, then the problem is that it is enough like the shock in the 80s to have still a current account that is moving after 30 years, maybe not, but maybe it's like the fact that inequality is still moving it give us like price to this uh, current account that is still positive or negative. But you're right that, I mean, eventually this should approach to zero. However, the trade balance is going to be positive or negative. I mean, that is like, so you're Michael, right. It's different whether you look at the current account Robert, versus trade sorry, balance. Robert, sorry, Robert, I, so we need, we need Michael. Okay, uh, thanks a lot, Federica. Uh, so I, uh, uh, your, uh, paper reminds me uh, a little bit of this uh, hypothesis of Bragu Rajan a few years ago um, after the financial crisis, uh, where he uh, connected inequality, uh, as I remember, to, uh, to large uh, public sector budget deficits. Um, and so in, in this book, Fault Lines. Uh, so I, I, I was surprised to see there was no connection between uh, public savings and inequality. Uh, did you look more closely at, at measurements of uh, public sector deficits or uh, public debt or anything like that? Um, so so the, the short answer is that for the moment, we just use the national account, so we didn't look like very closely. To, so I mean, we, we put the, um, I think it's like the borrowing of the government, the primary surplus or deficit of the government, uh, right, in the regression. But maybe we can run all the regression just to look a little bit more about public deficit. However, maybe the fact is that we control for the size of the government. So maybe this is going in some sense. Uh, and we also control in part before for the growth or for the GDP per capita. So maybe the, is the story of Rajan is going to be, is, it doesn't show much in our data because we control a little bit for that. Okay. Well, in the, so just to say in the time, when we look at different time periods, the private, the public savings contributes more if we kind of go 
beyond you know to 2014, uh, you see a bit of a trend. So it looks like that force is kind of coming into play. The private savings regression line is is flat, but there is a little bit of a trend in the the, the public savings. Okay. Can I add one point also? So uh, also the income inequality that we have in our measure is after tax income inequality. So th there is a little bit of a role of the government in the, in the tax and transfer. I see right, yeah, yeah. Can I ask a question on a different uh, aspect of your story from the very beginning of the presentation? Is it actually true that default rates are lower in uh, high inequality countries? So, of course, that you want to answer because you're like the expert on default. Uh... I mean, the, the one thing to be clear is that, you know, the model we write, write down features no default in equilibrium. So the model has no implications about default across countries. Um, so that's a, maybe not a satisfactory answer. No, so I think, uh, you know, if you look, compare the US to Sweden, kind of the two outliers, right? The default costs we tend to think of as being lower like in the US um, than in European countries. And I think that, you know, the, the implication there is really that, you know, if you go back to kind of the Kruger-Perry story, there they find that kind of the income risk channel is maybe too strong. Uh, so that it implies kind of too much risk sharing than we see in the data. And so if somehow, you know, there was a kind of a, a negative correlation between inequality and default costs, that would weaken, you know, the, the channel. It would make it kind of more in line with actually the data. So I think that would be the story that we look at is that, you know, kind of the non-pecuniary default costs may be higher in, or the pecuniary ones in countries that are more equal. Uh, and that kind of will mitigate the strength of the channel that we have in, in the model that we write down. So I think that's actually going to go in our favor that otherwise the, the risk sharing channel just gets too strong in the limited commitment model. And another thing to say is that if you look at said that the financial index, I mean, it's not a perfect measurement, right? But there is this measurement of financial development index that has been used, for example, by Guadrini, Rosrul, and Mendoza. There we found uh, a positive correlation with inequality. That's exactly what our mother would predict, right? That country with high income inequality them to have better financial market for this measure. Then it's a debatable measure because it's like not everybody agree that is the best measure to measure financial market development. Yeah, that's that's more like a measure of uh, uh, luxury financial services for the rich. But anyway, that's a different discussion. Um, okay, so. Um, Thank you very much, uh, Federica and uh, Sidekicks, uh, for this uh, first presentation. And the uh, next speaker is Florin. Uh, hello, everybody. Can you see my screen? And can you hear me? OK, I take that for a yes. Thank you very much. Uh, it's a huge honor to be here. Uh, I uh, have to say that my... Uh, Sidekick is not here. <laughs> Unfortunately, he was supposed to come. So this is a joint paper with, with uh, you know, <laughs> who, how many people can say that their sidekick is Mark Melitz? So yes, yeah, so this is a paper that's joint with, with Mark. And uh, we do two things in this paper. They're both in the title and I'm going to kind of explain them uh, uh, soon after. So the motivation for this is for us at a kind of a more personal level is kind of a, uh, historical motivation, which is that we've been working on these topics for quite a long time. And uh, many of you in the audience have also been working on these topics for quite a long time, which is to try to kind of convince uh, people that, that entry, exit and variety are also important for business cycles and for kind of short term macro, and not only for endogenous growth and trade and geography and all these things for which we kind of say, of course, they're important. And so we've been doing this for about two decades in, in joint work with Fabio Gironi, most notably. Um, uh, but, you know, this, uh, we, we, Mark and I kept thinking of these models and playing around with them and using them for various things. And when the crisis hit, we thought, aha, you know, this is kind of if ever people did not need to be convinced that these margins are important for explaining recessions, expansions, and so on, this is like, this, this is it. Uh, why? Because you look out the window and you see that, you know, many businesses close or maybe close temporarily, whatever, from the standpoint of our model, this is irrelevant. Uh, so, you know, kind of business cycle uh, notion of, of exit closing down for one quarter, one year, whatever. 
And also from a demand perspective, if you think of not being able to consume some varieties for a while, this is actually exactly the same thing. No matter where you put where you put the, the entry and exit, if it's in producers or, or varieties. And you know, in normal times, there is a bit of an issue with the data for this. And I guess a bit of a trouble that, that the, this literature has had was, you know, how do you measure these things? at business cycle frequency, most of our standard, what we really like to, uh, to use in our models, there are also measures that come out with a lag of like one, sometimes two years, this business employment dynamics uh, uh, stuff, and they're imperfect for a variety of reasons. I think one of the main uh, kind of nice things about this crisis, there are not so many, but on the data front, uh, there's been like a lot of effort in more like real-time data uh, on extensive margins and looking at things that we can learn from at, you know, high frequency, real-time. And we saw Veronica's presentation yesterday, for example, is one example of exploiting some of this data. And, you know, one style fact that we've learned is that if you look, for example, at the Chetty, at all Opportunity Insights, but then there are other papers, including Veronica's from yesterday, that, you know, exit, uh, uh, some notion of exit from small, uh, small businesses, uh, some measure of it tells you that 40% of businesses closed down early on in the crisis. And if you look, uh, you know, yesterday, one third of them were still closed. So this is like, you know, it's, it's a big thing and it matters also in, in aggregate. And some of these papers look, look at that too. Uh, another thing uh, is uh, entry. You know, there is some new data from from the uh, you know business formation statistics, uh, business applications with without land wages, etc. John Haltywanger has has done a lot of, on that, and in fact, some of it with Veronica, uh, where you see that early on in the crisis, there's been a forty percent fall in. Uh, entry too, although entry actually recovered afterwards, part of it due to reallocation, and our model will actually have something to say about that too, but I'm not going to focus so much on that. I'm going to focus on what we think is like the first order and first kind of issue that, that, that like, like the big issue, which is, you know, how do you explain a recession? If you look at the uh, weekly economic index, for example, you know, URI yesterday showed a different measure of, you know, how do you measure a recession understood as a negative output gap, and he built a very compelling case for there being a, a really sizable, a negative output gap uh, in this recession. And I think most macroeconomists would agree that no matter what measure you use, you know, this, the, the WEI tells you that the recession has been like minus 12.5%, and it's been actually protracted, and only the data that came out last week shows uh, a very large recovery, but nevertheless, you know, it lasted for one year and it stayed sort of under potential for a long time. So what we're trying to do here is to build a simple theory that, that is rooted in our understanding of entry and exit uh, and business cycles that we're going to try to use to understand the COVID-19 recession. And let me jump the kind of data and we can come back to that. So that theory is made of two components. And the first component is what we call the entry exit multiplier. And it is something that in fact is there in any model that has two things, a free entry and exit and sticky prices. Therefore, it is something that we had under our noses for 20 years, but we just didn't see it. And many other people who have written such models had too, but it, it, to the best of our knowledge has not been a formalized or analyzed uh, as such. That is to say that entry and exit under sticky prices overreact to TFP shocks. So you get a much larger response of entry and exit when prices are sticky at the individual good or firm level. And this multiplier somehow magically is equal to theta, and theta being the elasticity of substitution or demand in a CES existing framework, which under monopolistic competition by restriction needs to be larger than one, okay? So this theta larger than one will be the multiplier because the one will actually be the response under flexible prices. So we're going to take a benchmark under which the response of entry under flexible prices, TFP goes up and down, entry goes up and down one to one, and then under sticky prices, it will do that theta times one. But that doesn't necessarily mean that there is what we call aggregate demand amplification. That is to say, 
now when you have a negative supply shock, so let's take an increment, a negative uh, innovation to A will, will be our TFP kind of metaphor for any supply shock. If you have a, TF, a negative TFP shock, will you get an aggregate demand recession? Let's say, would you get output under sticky prices that goes down more than one-to-one, -one, so more than under flexible prices, that is to say, will you get a negative output gap? So the first point doesn't say that. The second point says that in our model, that is true, that, 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 that you do get that. There is someone who is unmuted. If they could mute themselves, that'd be great. Uh, so uh, to do that, we have... Uh, we have... Uh, uh, we, we need to distinguish between these four models, and we'll, we'll do this throughout the paper in order to kind of understand the channels. So in the first row, we will have uh, a model with no entry and exit, the standard, the standard model where we turn off our channel. And then we're going to add in the second row uh, our, our channel of entry and exit. And then we're going to distinguish in the two cases of flexible prices and sticky prices, OK? So think of this the first row as being RBC and the new Keynesian model, RBC with fixed investment, and the second one being a model with entry with flexible sticky prices. Under flexible prices, with no entry and exit, if you take a benchmark of output is equal to TFP times labor, and you think of some labor supply, which we will use, in fact, for the benchmark, such that income and substitution effects cancel out, so labor does not move in equilibrium, you're going to have under flexible prices a TFP going down by 1%, output goes down by 1%. That will be our benchmark. It turns out, and this is well known to those of us teaching uh, the new Keynesian model and then having to tell our students, you know, this is what the model says. When the TFP goes down in the new Keynesian model, output under sticky prices goes down less than one to one. So it goes down by less than it goes down under flexible prices when the shock is temporary, I must say. And that means that the output gap is actually positive to a negative uh, transitory TFP shock, okay? So non-permanent TFP shock. This is, I mean, you know, uh, it's actually related to the response of our work and we're gonna work through that carefully. Now, if you add entry and exit, it turns out that under flexible prices, and this is something that we've known and is, is related to, to you know, increasing returns to variety. And, and we also have some version of this in our previous work. You do get some amplification of the recession. That is to say, if you have a negative TFP shock, output will go down by more than in a model without entry and exit, will go down by this X, and this X is larger than one. So in absolute value, you get a bigger recession. But our key point here is that under sticky prices, so our second finding, is that under sticky prices, you will have a response of output that will be this big X that in absolute value will be larger than X. It is, is to say you will get an overreaction under sticky prices. So you will get a negative output gap under sticky prices. And in fact, it will be larger when the shock is larger. So there will be some concavity in, in, the, in the policy function. In other words, you will get a negative output gap. So entry, just adding entry to this model completely flips its predictions around. And now you can think, you know, okay, well, wait a second, you're flipping something around, something else is flipping in the background, the usual kind of game we're playing. And it turns out that what is flipping in the background is something that we like that is flipping and is something that kind of drives this uh, maybe uncomfortable prediction of the, of the standard and New Keynesian model that is this kind of sharp prediction of, 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 of positive output gap. So now it turns out that by adding entry and exit to this model, the response of ours work to TFP, which is actually essential for, for this whole co movement business, is going to be the same under New Keynesian and the RBC model. So, you know, we can go have a beer with so everybody from Minnesota and from, from, from Cambridge, Massachusetts, and from everywhere, uh, you know, Barcelona uh, can go to. To have, to have a beer together and talk about other things and the response of ours were to TFP shows. So then, uh, so we're building in doing this on a huge literature that some of it we contributed to, which is entry, exit and variety to business cycles, so to monetary policy. And, uh, but it's also related to other theories of the COVID-19 recession, because this has been, of course, the question that many of us have tried to, to, to address over uh, these last months. And in particular to this paper, 
we're going to concentrate a bit on this paper because it will look like what we're getting is kind of the opposite of what they're getting. And this is actually, if you look close, it looks like that because it's a restriction on some elasticities that looks like exactly the other way around. And it's actually not the other way around, it, but because it, it pertains to, to, to different uh, model uh, objectives. And this is also related to, uh, to the, the whole debate of, of TFP and, and our work that, that I mentioned before. The model is really embarrassingly simple and it's simple because we kind of boiled it down and we distilled it to the simplest possible version that you can think of. It's a model where you have CES uh, preferences uh, where uh, these preferences are over individual goods and N is a number of goods. So little C of omega is consumption of the individual variety of omega. Theta is the elasticity of substitution between goods needs to be larger than one with monopolistic competition. The CPI of this economy is a price index, is also the, the CES, the Stiglitz integral of the individual goods. And the demand is kind of uh, the, the standard formula where theta is also the elasticity of demand. These goods are produced by monopolists and they are produced by using uh, a labor input at the individual level. And these monopolies, they have to pay a, a fixed cost and they have to pay this fixed cost every period. So we're gonna use a static uh, entry model here, just again, to clean the analytics and to isolate the one channel that we want to isolate. And this extends to, to models like the ones that we've been using and that are standard in endogenous growth with, with uh, sunk costs and dynamic entry and so on. So this, this fixed cost will pin down the number of firms. The key shock here is a negative is, is a TFP shock, and which will be the same for uh, for all uh, firms. And a negative innovation to this will be our metaphor for COVID-19, and it will be purely aggregate. Okay, it will hit everybody in the same way. Uh, something happens out there that's bigger than everybody uh, individually, and this is kind of the same as saying part of the labor force stays at home, is locked down, or stuff. It's completely isomorphic, actually. Um, a key object in these models is the benefit of variety, which is, in fact, the relative price. So if you can take it here by imposing uh, a symmetric equilibrium and you get the standard result that the relative price of an individual good over uh, the aggregate price level is a number of goods to the one over theta minus one, which is then the uh, the, the benefit of variety, the, this elasticity that says it is easier to satisfy a certain level of demand if you have more goods or if you introduce one good that was not there before then the, the price of that good goes from infinity to a finite thing and then you get deflation and the, in the idealized price index and you get inflation in, the, in relative price is the standard thing in models with variety grossman Feldman, Romer, everybody uh, so this of course will mean that you have increasing returns uh, at the aggregate level uh, due to variety I didn't say what indivi how individual prices are chosen and we're gonna use two polar cases. One will be prices are completely flexible and the other one will be that prices are actually completely fixed. And this will again be in order to completely isolate the demand, uh, the, the demand channel of, so the, so the kind of the, the aggregate demand channel uh, of, of uh, fixed prices. And then we're gonna generalize this to somewhere in between where firms can, uh, can reset their prices, but not fully to the, to the optimal price, Rothenberg style. Uh, no matter how prices are determined, the markup is well determined, and the markup is the relative price divided by the marginal cost, which is just wage divided by TFP, and the profit function, it's a symmetric equilibrium, so the profit function at the individual firm level is sales minus the, the labor uh, cost, but now the free entry exit equilibrium is an equilibrium where aggregate profits are zero in every period. But because the equilibrium is symmetric, uh, that means that individual profits are also zero. So you can see that the algebra then is like trivial. Okay, because from this restriction, you can pretty much back down everything. And in particular, you can derive an aggregate economy resource constraint that says, you know, on the left hand side, because we assume that there is no investment entry sort of thing and there is no physical capital, there is only consumption. On the right hand side, uh, there is output, but output is simply uh, labor, it's just labor because there are no profits, profits are zero. So consumption is actually uh, equal to labor income. And from aggregating the individual production function, then you get an aggregate production function that shows you that there are increasing returns 
to the number of variety, which is something again completely standard, Romer, Grossman, Heldman, and that you get, a, a, and that tells you that that the number of varieties here acts as a, kind of an endogenous productivity, if you will, or endogenous variety. Uh, so stuff will happen endogenously even after productivity has hit exogenously. So then the, the labor supply, so in order to close the model, we need two more things. We need the labor supply from the households uh, and we're gonna assume in the benchmark, a logarithmic utility function in, con in consumption. And then we're gonna work with CRRA and GHH and, and, and other uh, things. And this is important, why? Because that tells you that the labor supply is W divided by C with log utility is equal to hours to the power of phi standard CRRA uh, in, in, in labor. But then if C is equal to W times L, you see the W drops out and you get fixed hours. Huh? So you get income and substitution effects cancel out. And this, uh, this uh, allows us to, 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 to really completely clean out to the one mechanism that we want to focus on. And then we're gonna show that this uh, holds in, in the more quantitative model too, completely unchanged. The last, I'm representing the monetary economics uh, uh, program here, so there you go. Please contemplate the presence of money in this in this uh, economy. Uh, we're, so we're in the benchmark, we're going to have the simplest possible aggregate demand equation, which is that there's going to be a money rule. There's going to be the quantity of money is equal to P, big P times big C, and this generalizes. In fact, we prove in an appendix that this can completely isomorphic to an Euler equation, Taylor rule, and all that. But you know, quantity equation where the central bank just decides how much money to issue is kind of the easiest thing in which you can you can work under sticky prices. With that model that fits on one page, then you can solve it in closed form, and this will be the solution in the four cases that I described before. I'm not going to go through it. I'm going to show you the uh, graphs. I'm going to show you the figure of how this works. Notice one thing in the analytical solution: the number of firms under flexible prices has a one over theta here and does not have a one over theta under, under flexible, under sticky prices, and that's our entry exit multiplier. So that's our first proposition, which is a response of entry and exit of the number of firms to uh, a, a TFP shock is theta times the response of entry under flexible prices to a TFP shock, and this theta is larger than one, and the intuition is actually uh, very simple. When you have a bad TFP shock, under flexible prices, under entry and exit. I mean, the first thing is TFP shock going down is there is, you know, bad times, the profits are going down, you're gonna get some exit. So you're gonna get some adjustment on the extensive margin. On the other hand, the, uh, the marginal cost of firms is W divided by A. When A is going down, marginal cost is going up. So monopolists would like to increase their price. When prices are flexible, they, they do increase their prices. So you get some adjustment on the extensive margin, some adjustment on the intensive margin. And this is the optimal thing to do in this economy because it's an economy where, because there is exit stiglitz and entry is free, uh, et cetera, entry is actually uh, optimal. So this is kind of, this is uh, all good. Now, suppose that you turn off the intensive margin adjustment. So you turn off the adjusting their price. Now firms would like to increase their prices, but they cannot, they are stuck with a price that is too low. If they're stuck with a price that is too low, they will uh, incur a loss. And these losses in an equilibrium with free entry and exit translate immediately into exit. And this exit, remember the aggregate production function endogenously means that productivity then goes down again because there is exit and this acts from the aggregate point of view as a, as, as a decrease in kind of endogenous productivity. So you get disproportionately more adjustment on the extensive margin because you took away the intensive margin and you end up with an equilibrium with, with firms that are too few and too large. And this is a distortion. You would actually like the, the former, but you get the latter. And we think that this is not completely crazy in, in the sense that you know the, the notion that you cannot increase your prices as an individual firm in a slump uh, when there is a negative large shock, it's kind of if ever there is a justification for sticky prices, maybe this is not a bad case. But in a sense, it's also a metaphor for some kind of barrier of adjusting on the intensive margin. And we saw another version of this in Veronica's paper uh, yesterday. So then just to say, you know, remember these functions were linear. So now uh, with blue, you have the number of firms as a function of TFP under sticky prices and under 
under a flexible crisis and this slope is much larger, but these functions are linear. Now at the aggregate level, so does this transform, transform into aggregate demand amplification? And the, the answer is yes, but to, to understand why we need to think of the non-linearity. So now the non-linearity starts to matter. Let's start uh, with a model with no entry and exit. You know, RBC model C is equal to A times L, L is fixed under log utility. Consumption as a function of TFP is just a linear function with slope one. Under sticky prices, so what, now if A goes down, C goes down one to one. Under sticky prices with a, a very stark assumption that we made that there is this uh, money, money uh, quant quantity of money rule, when there is a negative shock now, consumption is actually fixed. Why? Because C is equal to M divided by P. If P is fixed and M is fixed, consumption is fixed. But now if there is a negative shock, that means that consumption stays higher than under flexible prices. That is to say, it means that you have a positive output gap in response to a negative uh, TFP shock. And what drives this? Of course, now if you have a Taylor rule, et cetera, et cetera, you can get a little bit closer to this. And in fact, if you have a monetary policy rule that replicates a flexible price equilibrium, which is an optimal thing to do, you can completely close the output gap, but you can never go under, okay? So that, that's kind of the key point. So, but what makes it, what makes this positive output gap? What makes it so that you can actually consume more than the TFP would tell you? What makes it so is that under sticky prices, now you actually increase your hours worked. And you increase your hours worked because when TFP goes down, marginal cost goes up, profits are going down, and profits going down in a model in which, you know, when profits go down, there are no firms coming in and out. Uh, then this transfer, transforms one-to-one -one into a negative income effect on households and households work more and they consume more than they would if they did not have this negative income effect. So, you know, negative response of, of ours, uh, sorry, positive response of ours is, is, the, same, uh, is the same thing as, 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 a, as a positive response of, of the output gap in, the, in response to negative TFP shock. Now, if you go to our model with uh, entry and exit, you understand already that I told you is about the profits response and now we're taking away the profits by having firms coming in and out. Under flexible prices, you still get some amplification. So if you think, you know, uh, prices are not sticky, you could still get like higher recession just from entry and exit because of this uh, return to variety that is still there, the, the usual amplifier in trade and endogenous growth and so on. But under sticky prices, the key point is now that the blue line is gonna look something like this. It's like a concave function that when you have a negative shock, you actually go, you have a negative output gap and this output gap is larger, the larger the shock gets. So in the paper, then we explain this. Notice the other thing that to first order, this is actually not true. Why? Because again, we are in CES, Dixie Stiglitz, the equilibrium with flexible prices there is actually efficient. So by having some first order change around this efficient equilibrium, by the envelope theorem, you get zilch, you get nothing, okay? You get squat here. Uh, that is to say, there is an envelope theorem argument that tells you that there is neutrality to first order. The sticky price and the flexible price equilibrium are identical. And this is my, my previous paper. It, it's a, it's, I have a separate paper that looks like this that, that, that is published already. So now what we're focusing on are these higher order terms that so we show analytically that this is completely driven by, so it's not, we take a second order approximation of the consumption function as a function of the shock. And we show that this difference is driven entirely by, by the second order term. So by, by the concavity, this output gap is completely kind of second order and it gets larger, the larger uh, the shock, the larger the shock gets. Now, since the number of firms itself is a linear function in TFP, of course, this uh, concavity is driven by the concavity of the consumption function in the number of varieties. And that's how we explain this intuition. Then I'm, I will not have time to get into this, but it's really, the intuition is really that uh, sticky prices, what it does to you to, is to distort the allocation between the intensive and the extensive margin. So that will create an inefficiency that will mean that your consumption will always be a smaller, uh, will always be smaller and that will depend on, on the benefit of variety because the benefit of variety is what parameterizes 
how important the extensive margin is relative to the intensive margin. So I'm happy to talk about this more. I wanted to show you three more things or four more things very quickly. Uh, first, the quantitative model. We do this then by having, you know, Rottenberg pricing and then an Euler equation where the relevant inflation rate is inflation in the CPI index for intertemporal substitution. But then in the Taylor rule of the central bank, it is actually the PPI inflation because this is what we've shown in our previous work with Fabio, that this is what's optimal for the central bank uh, to target in, in such economies. So in the, you need to solve this to higher order. So we solve this with global methods, because again, if you solve it to the first order with, with Dixie Stiglitz, you will not get anything. But if you solve it, and we use Dynair for this, if you solve this to the higher order, we do a standard TFP shock that's kind of calibrated to minus 20%. You do get an output gap that's actually 12 point, you know, 13 percent, like you have it in the in the standard model. So you get a much larger response of the number of firms under sticky prices, the blue line. This is the entry exit multiplier that does trans transfer into an aggregate demand amplification, a negative output gap. Notably, the response of ours is the same under both because we have log utility and there is no income effect on ours anymore because we took away the profits. So this income effect goes actually into the exit margin now. So, you know, RBC equal new Keynesian model once you introduce entry and exit when it comes to the response of hours work. This is kind of trivial here, is less trivial when you have a kind of GHH preferences so we can deviate from this invariance proposition. And there we show, uh, we show analytically that, you know, under no entry and exit, the response of hours is positive under under a flexible prices, negative under sticky prices, and is actually completely identical under flexible and sticky prices when you have entry and exit, it may still be positive or negative. Huh? And so, you know, it depends what the data says, but now it will be driven by, is the shock permanent or not? What is the labor supply elasticity? What's the income effect and so on, which I think are things that are more natural for driving the sign of the response of hours work than are, are firms uh, able or not to reset their price. That, that's all we're saying. Then, you know, this, so we had this kind of higher order thing, uh, 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 elements driving the, the output gap. We then deviate from the Dixie Stiglitz preference to show that you can actually get first order uh, output gaps too. So if you deviate in the dimension of having a benefit of variety that is different from the markup, so if you have inefficient entry, now we have sticky prices as a mechanism that boosts the response of entry. Of course, if you have an equilibrium where the preferences for variety are such that you like variety too much and the market gives you uh, too little of that variety, whatever you have that boosts the response of entry will give you a first order benefit of of uh, of uh, of, uh, of uh, entry, so of course then you have a first order output gap, and this is what we show here formally that when the benefit of variety uh, is larger than the the markup, then the incentive of the market to create that variety, then you have a first order uh, effect. So you'll get a, a, an output gap to the first order. The Louis, last thing that I, I want to can say. Can I recommend you start uh, yes. wrapping up? Yes, I, that's the last thing I want to say. I promise I'm going to kind of say how this relates to the, the Guerrieri et al. paper. Where, uh, so that, let me just say that very briefly. We're then doing the, the CRRA. Uh, so we're, we're going to look at this model under deviating from log utility. So CRRA, where now sigma is intertemporal assistive of substitution. And we redo our algebra and we show that the entry exit multiplier now occurs whenever theta is larger than sigma both for the response of entry and for the response of the output gap. In other words, what we need in our framework is that when you have a negative a TFP shock, consumers should be willing to substitute between individual goods. You cannot go to the cinema, uh, you, uh, subs you subscribe Netflix or Amazon Prime. You cannot do a karate or, or uh, Aikido because you broke your hand or whatever. Uh, you do Tai Chi or something, you do something remotely, okay? So you so this requirement here, theta larger than sigma, is a requirement on the individual level of submodularity, of substitutability. 
this is, it looks like the opposite of what this other paper gets. And we think, you know, this is kind of very reasonable in our setup because this setup pertains to goods, to a substitution between goods. And this is kind of clearly somewhere between four and eight. And this is clearly between kind of zero and two. Uh, but the, the reason why it looks like it's the opposite of what this other paper gets is that is actually different things. So we're looking at very different experiments because here we're looking at the very disaggregated level and this other paper, the way we understood it is working with kind of sectoral things. There are sectoral shocks, one good disappear. And then if one good disappears for fixed marginal utility of consumption in order to have demand for the other good goes down, go down too, you need the cross derivative between the two be positive. In other words, you need the opposite, which is complementarity. But that's really about sectors and you could have the two where you have kind of a nested CES and you have this kind of disaggregated substitutability and this kind of more aggregated sectoral uh, complementarity and the two we think would reinforce each other. So we don't, I mean, we think that, that these are kind of really a very separate thing. So I'm not gonna uh, uh, go through this. And let me just say that, yes, yeah, so what we try to do is to build a simple theory of, of supply driven uh, demand shortages that's made of these two things, entry exit multiplier, entry and exit respond much more under sticky prices, TFP shocks. And this can lead to aggregate demand amplification through endogenous entry, through, through, through this endogenous response of entry, uh, which differentiates our, our theory from other uh, theories that have been put forward. Uh, and this can be driven either by cur curvature or inefficiency in the entry process. And we think that this condition that we get is actually very plausible. You're more willing to substitute between goods than you are to substitute uh, intertemporally. And in doing so, this is really, it kind of solves this uh, New Keynesian RBC controversy of the uh, uh, response of our work. So I'm, I'm done. Thank you very much. Thanks, Florin. Uh, Anton. Yes, um, thanks for a very interesting presentation. One aspect that I don't find very plausible is that firms would um, rather exit the market than adjust their price. You now there's um, a sense in which the um, assumption of price stickiness really is taken to the extreme here because um, it is the firms that are getting a lot of demand, those that are stuck with an old price um, that are um, exiting here, right? Because they're incurring losses. But I would think um, it's relatively easy for these firms to contain losses, uh, either by reducing their output or by raising the price and, uh, and um, avoid having to exit the market, which is really at the, at the core of your mechanism to, to uh, obtain the entry exit multiplier. So. I was wondering whether a more plausible price stickiness mechanism, say um, menu cost type of or other state dependent pricing adjustment would not um, um, go in the, in the direction of uh, mitigating your result. Yeah, so excellent point. And I, uh, I mean, I should have said this. I think one way to read this is that this model screams for uh, state dependent pricing. Uh, the purpose here is to really isolate, you know, let as you said, let's take price stickiness to the extreme. And that will, you know, that will kind of isolate, completely distill what is the effect of this entry and exit in the kind of purest uh, way. Of course, now if you start thinking, well, but maybe you do get some action on the intensive margin, and maybe in particular if there is some kind of significant heterogeneity and what, what firms can do and what kind of shocks they have and what kind of demand they have and so on. Maybe some of them will actually be able to, to adjust on the intensive margin. Point taken, I mean, I completely agree. So this is not, this is really a theoretical point that is to say, you know, there is a mechanism there that drives things in a certain way. Now, how, you know, how plausible, how kind of significant this extensive margin thing is quantitatively, I think this is a different, uh, uh, question, but also I think theoretically it's super interesting. It would be super interesting to marry this to a state-dependent pricing uh, model. So we should talk. Refit. Yes, yeah, so this was really um, 
much food for thought and well presented. Thank you for that. I have a question about uh, our TFP relationship. Could you talk a little bit about that in particular on what is the empirics that is there um, given our current understanding and what does the model say? Because I am at the point where, you know, in business cycle frequencies, there's positive core movements, but, you know, Bozo, Fernald and Kimball tell me that on impact, there is negative core movements. And, you know, is that what you have in mind? And what exactly it is that this model says that the new Keynesian model does not? Yes. I had long conversations both with uh, Shushanto Basu and with Jordi Gali about this. So, uh, because of course this kind of goes against, but you know, I, the, I think the, the evidence, my understanding of the evidence and of the more recent evidence is that we really need to think carefully of the response to identified transitory changes in TFP because Jordi's initial evidence was about things identified through long run restrictions. And there is some notion of there is a permanent effect. And there is some notion that maybe that is a shock to the growth rate of TFP. And we know that in the standard New Keynesian model, if you have a shock to the growth rate of TFP, it looks like a transitory shock in the RBC model. So that, you know, you can get various kind of configurations of these things depending on, on, on this. What I uh, would like to uh, to point to is the evidence that actually speaks directly to this that we that was mentioned in the slides, which is uh, Persman and Straub, uh, the International Economic Review paper, and then Foroni, Furlanetto, and uh, Le Petit, and then probably other papers too that actually identified through sign restrictions uh, transitory TFP shocks, and they have shown that ours actually behave uh, like pretty much like predicted by the RBC model. But again, this is even not something that we need to get into. What our model delivers is that the response of ours work is exactly the same regardless of price stickiness. Now, you give me your favorite data uh, uh, impulse response, we can match it, but it will not depend on price stickiness. It will depend on labor elasticity, persistence of the shock, et cetera, et cetera. So this is more like the... Uh, how our, our model speaks to that evidence. Thank you for that. But thanks, great, great question. I didn't have time to go into that in detail. Anyone else? There is Esther. <coughs> I see Fadi. Yeah, I mean, just if there is time, just a comment and a curiosity because in the case of Italy, what we have observed is actually, you know, a very uh, big decline in firm's exit, right? Failures rate are, 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 you know, well below 2019. They have been throughout 2020 and also towards 2021. So I wonder, you know, and, and at the same time, in Italy, the output gap has actually worsened than, than in other countries. So in a sense, it looks like, you know, the, the opposite contrafactual relative to, to what your model says. So it's, it's just, you know, how can we square Italy within, within your model, given that there was no exit and actually the output gap was worse than, than in other countries. Yes, I, I don't know the Italian data, so I haven't seen I haven't seen this data. I should, I should look at it. I know this holds actually in the UK, it holds in, uh, Netherlands, uh, Andrea Colciago told me who has a related paper on this. Uh, I don't know the Italian data. Uh, I guess, yes, one would have to think of, of uh, what is it special about Italy that gives one a, a negative output gap. Maybe it's a positive TFP shock, like the standard New Keynesian model without the <laughs> entry sets. Yeah. Not sure about a positive TFP shock in Italy, like, you know, over the last 20 no, years. No, I'm, I'm joking, but it's a, per, you know, maybe it's a negative shock to permanent TFP, to the growth rate of TFP, which would actually give you the right co-movement in the standard Mucasian model. And, you know, permanent decline in TFP, maybe that's more. But, you know, the more serious answer is that I, I, I don't know. I, I'm, I'm actually surprised to learn that in Italy there hasn't been an exit. Yeah, just, just out of public supports, right? Public support schemes were very generous. And, and what happened is that many firms that were supposed to exit in normal times, they did not. And but, you know, the notion of exit here, 
but I should say the notion of exit here, if you close down for one year, let's exit from the model's point of view. You're not in the market anymore. You're not producing that variety anymore. So that's exit. So I, I think, yeah, so this is more about the, what's the mapping with the right to entry and exit data. And this goes more to the, what's the data that speaks to these models. And what we argued in our previous uh, work is that you should look at varieties. And this is very hard to come by at the, uh, at the business cycle frequency for a kind of uh, large universe of things. You can get this for groceries uh, at the you know, scanner data on groceries and so on, but you could say that's not really a significant part of GDP. So there is this tension there, assuredly, uh, but uh, I would say that one should not think of exit here as a firm goes bust and then files for bankruptcy and is never to be seen again. If it Again, the variety is not there anymore because your restaurant closes down for two quarters from the model, that's exit. And exactly, so if they are non-producing but alive in an accounting sense, that would be exit. Thank you. Okay, uh, thanks Florin. I think we can close it. I don't see other hands up. Thank you Florin for the presentation. Thank we, you, thank um, you. I think this room will stay open for a, an undefined number of minutes, but I think enough for, uh, for people to engage in a few further back and forth if, if, if you want. Um, and then at some, at some point, um, uh, we will all be- to. At 10 to. At, at so, 10 okay. to, we'll start right. the next So that section. means that this room will still be kind of open for another 10 minutes or so. And then Absolutely. In and then in 10 minutes, we will all be redirected.